And we are live, and I am back after a few week hiatus. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I have John Belden from Upper Edge in the chair. He's got some big reveals today for us. John, welcome to the show. <laughs> Good. Nice to be on show. Your show, John. This is this is this is your international reveal of <laughs> of some of some research you've been doing with Upper Edge on something that sounds kind of scary, which is systems integrator value erosion. That is some scary stuff. I don't think anyone wants that. Uh, no, you're right. Nobody, no, nobody wants it, but everybody experiences it. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to define exactly what value erosion is, uh, the components of it, how to avoid it. And I'm really looking forward to that because like I said, this is original research you've been doing. And I can't, can't wait to get into it. Uh, for those who have been wondering, I had an outdoor mis misadventure health-wise. I don't want to get into the details, but that kept me off video for a few weeks. But I am back, and yes, I am going to try to do this every Friday, but keep in mind, there's a little bit of summer juggling going on with a couple of events and stuff, so it's going to take a little while for me to hit that 4 p.m. every week, Eastern time, but basically coming back. So if you miss me, welcome back. Uh, as you know, there's the rules of the show are you can interrupt at any time. This is an interactive format, so be careful what you type because it will be publicized. So start getting your questions in. Now, as far as John is concerned, the big question for this show when I have a guest is, well, why? Because I consider my guests pretty special. I'm pretty selective about who I have on. But I do like to dip into Upper Edge, and John's been on a podcast of mine in the past. You can find that on my Busting the Omni Channel series. He and Adam Mansfield uh, were part of an on-site taping I did and John uh, and Upper Edge, what, what I like about what they do is they keep a strong independent voice. They don't derive m money from vendors and they perform an advisory function to customers and they're religious about that. And also they share a lot of information on their blog and I'll share a link to John's blog in a bit. But the point is they put a lot of information out there. And if you take a look at them, you'll see a lot of it's very strongly worded stuff uh, John says this topic gets him pretty worked up, so I'm looking forward to that, John. <laughs> uh, looking forward to revealing some of the things we've yeah. identified. <laughs> yeah, some some of the things that uh, I call them bones of contention. I'll be looking forward to a few of yours here. Um, but before we get into uh, value erosion, um, you, you have kind of an overarching theme, I would say, in a lot of your public work, which is this view of transformation, right? Mm -hmm. And I would think of it as like the realities of transformation. Um, so how, how is it that you go about gathering the, 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 the information and, and field awareness that kind of informs your views? Cause you have pretty strong views about transformation. So how do you get that in insight? Yeah. So I, let's, I'll go down three paths. First of all, just a little bit about my background, right? I worked in industry for 31 years. Uh, I was at a manufacturing company. I led the transformation there, right? Uh, in terms of putting in SAP, we used Accenture, kind of full disclosure of, of, of what we did there. So I developed, let's call it both my appreciation for how hard it was and my cynicism for some of the things that I actually hear coming out of the mouths of the, of the systems integrators is whether it's real or not from that standpoint, right? So that was kind of the root of how I got started in there. And as I was going through that, one of the things that I looked at was how many times transformations failed. Mm -hmm. And I became more uh, interested in that and started to do research primarily into transformation failures as a foundation. So I then got into reading all the lawsuits that I could get my hands on because lawsuits are a great source of information of two parties bickering about what the other one did wrong and what, you know, what went right. So that became a, a kind of the, the next did you, point. Did you actually read all those lawsuits? That I love out? reading. There is nothing that I love more than a good lawsuit. I mean, and the, the, the guy, the guys at Upper Edge make fun of me because I'm out there. John, I even went as far as IBM was being sued by Israeli Chemical. Okay, Israeli Chemicals and is, is an is uh, uh, obviously an Israeli company. All the lawsuits are written in Hebrew, so I got a guy to translate. Oh my goodness, I got a guy to translate. You know, the, get me the documents, use Google Translate, then you go through and try to piece it all together. But to me, that's the most fascinating thing I could get my hands on are these lawsuits. And then the third thing that we do is obviously as a third party advisor, we are engaged with the clients that we're actually negotiating with. And one of the things that makes us or the, the that we're negotiating for and 
one of the things that makes us unique is that we work with those clients all the way through the engagement. So we don't just drop off once the contract signed. I like to I like to say we're the uh, we're the user manuals on how to get the most value out of your systems integrator because they don't come with one. And so I adapt or allure a lot of the learnings that come from those engagements I bring in as well. Yep. And uh, for those that missed Adam Mansfield's scorching appearance on the show a couple months ago, definitely check that out. He had some strong words to say again about how customers should should look to avoid cloud vendor locking because a lot of what you guys seem to focus on correct me if I'm wrong, is really helping customers at that moment of truth when they're negotiating arrangements with these various parties and making sure that, they, that they're that they on a more level playing field, right? Because customers are often at a disadvantage in these situations. They are almost 100% always in a disadvantage in these situations. Every, every engagement that I've been in, especially if the company is, you know, I'm, I hate to draw kind of draw parallels here, but if you're a company that is let's call it $10 billion in size or less, right? You don't have the opportunity to run big transformations across your organizations on a regular basis. This is a once in a career kind of an opportunity for most people that get involved, right? And so there's just this kind of this fundamental lack of awareness of what does good look like? Mm -hmm. And so part of what we try to do is to work with our clients in defining what does good look like within a contract? And good doesn't necessarily mean lowest price, right? Good right. to me means highest value in return for the dollars that you're going to spend. And I would much rather see a client get a lot of value out of, I'll call it a, a good amount of money, than low right. value out of a good amount of money, right? So right. many times I'm focused on the upside of the contract. What can you get in addition versus how do you get the price down? Yeah. And isn't it funny, John, how the cheapest contracts often seem to wind up being the ones with the most change requests and the most well, scope creep and all that stuff. Yeah. It's, you know. uh, yeah we'll get into that because yeah. it's, a, it's a frustrating thing for me. Indeed. All right. Well, before we get into uh, vendor value erosion, which I do want to get into, uh, I, I do want to ask you a general question about transformation. Sure. Uh, transformation is obviously heavily pushed by pretty much all enterprise software vendors. And there's an obvious reason for that, right? Because if if a customer embraces transformation, there's a good chance they might embrace that vendor's view of transformation. And obviously, if you're thinking about transformation, you're probably going to buy some software to make it happen. Right. But it does raise the question, which we've been kicking around for years, really, which is, is transformation a real, achievable, legitimate goal? Or is it a vendor marketing creation? What is your take? It's a legitimate goal. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reason I call it a legitimate goal is every single company, every single organization that I've been involved with has always been an organization that is changing in some aspect, right? They're always on some trajectory or aspect of change. You, I mean, you can't stay the same. Everybody knows you can't stay the same and actually survive, right? So what I would define transformation is, is what's that leap that you're going to take along that line of that trajectory of change? Are you going to take a big leap? Or are you taking smaller leaps, right? So transformation is more or less how far do you jump on this plane of where you're going to travel anyway? So mm -hmm. is it real? It's absolutely real. Uh, there's no question because without it, you stand still. And if you stand still, you'll eventually go out of business. So I'd absolutely say it's real, John. Yeah. And, and having said that, I think we can probably agree that that, that that the customer needs to define their own view of that that's, exactly. in, that's independent of whatever marketing literature and, and right. promises that they're receiving around that. Well, right. And that, and I will tell you that's, you know, I'm, I'm working with one client right now that sent us their business case, right? And I mean, I don't want to say I almost threw up all over it, right? But, but the business case was essentially an inventory of capabilities that the software had and that was their case. That was their transformation case. And I just looked at it and I said, "Oh my God! You know, this is, uh, guys, this is like this is like going out and saying you want to buy a brand new truck. And one of the things that you really like about it is it's got a, a towing package. Mm. Great. Do you need a towing package? Do you have a boat to tow? Right? Do you live close to the water? You know, you ask those questions. If you know, if the answer to all three of those things are no, then you don't need it. But their business case was filled with all of the big features and functions that exist within the software, right? Without necessarily knowing why they needed it, 
right? So that kind of goes along your point of, I'm trying to sell you these software that has features and functions in it. You need them because they're cool. If you put it in, then you're going to be transforming. That I don't buy as a transformation, right? But defining where you want to be three years from now as an organization, right? And then putting in place the plan and what is the capabilities that you need to get there, right? And bring in the smartest people you can to align to it. That's a transformation. Right. Now, when we get, we're going to get to this systems integrator value erosion topic in a minute, but I want to tie the two together. And, and the way I want to do that is obviously the systems integrator for, for a lot of companies plays an important role in the transformation effort. So can you sort of define that role and then we'll get into the problems that customers run into around yeah. the value? So, so the, I'm going to refer to this as the yin and the yang. Okay, whenever you're getting ready to put in a, a brand new system, you're typically going to need two sets of skills, right? You're going to need the skills that are going to come from the client side, really, to say, do I understand the business case? Do I understand how the how the business operates today? Do I understand uh, kind of what the um, the overall organization, how it functions and what the political structure looks like. You got to have that from the client side. But normally from the systems integrator, you also need somebody that's going to understand what are the capabilities of the software and what is, I'll call it, a methodology to go from point A to point B. And you've got to bring both those pieces together in order to be able to I'll be successful in the implementation. So when I'm looking at a systems integrator, I'm looking to say, are they bringing the pieces that complement what the client is willing to put onto the project? So you're looking for that complementary yin and the yang on the systems integrator. Mm, exactly. They should be your partner in, in transformation, not the external party that's exploiting value at, at the expense exactly. of your... Yeah. Now, yep. yeah. now that I would absolutely encourage you to make sure that your systems integrator is making money because you don't want to put them in a position where they're losing money because that's going right. to be bad for you, but you don't want them making bank on you mm -hmm. and your expense. It's, it's a value exchange, right? You want to feel good about what you're get, getting and receiving. And um, in, in, a, in, a, in a recent post, I'm going to put a link to your upredge profile in, uh, John's got some recent interesting posts. We're not going to get to them all today. Uh, there's what can you learn from $20 billion in IT projects, which kind of lays out some future research. 11 IT-enabled transformation leadership agenda items, which will give you some hands-on uh, tips that kind of pertain to transformation. We may not cover all of those today, but John just kind of alluded to a couple of them. And then why are ERP projects fail, which is always a fun topic, which we probably will run into a little bit today. Um, but now I want to get to your research reveal, John. You are working on ways to help customers reduce systems integrated value erosion. You actually right. have 12 tactics. We're going to see if we can get to count down all 12, but we may not get to them all. We'll see. Sure. But, but talk to us a little bit about this concept of value erosion, because that's a strong, interesting phrase. How did you seize upon that? Yeah. So one of the things, one of the things that I've done that I've said is, listen, we've talked about, or people have seen the statistics, and I and I'll throw them out. They come from Standish, they come from McKinsey, they come various sources, right? They say sixty five percent of all uh, major transformations fail. Okay, we'll take that as a as a fact. If that's the case, right? Then wouldn't you expect to see a similar kind of a failure rate? within the systems integrator landscape, Accenture, Deloitte, IBM, Capgemini, right? But every single one of those companies is making a significant amount of money. So when I started to look at this and I started to say, well, okay, I've, so I've got all these failures over here on the left-hand side, and I've got all these success stories over here on the right-hand side being the systems integrators, right? It's clear then that the systems integrators are continuing to make a significant amount of money, even when you fail. And, and so that became kind of the core then to say, okay, so how are they making all of this money, even though you're failing? And when I started to kind of put the pieces together, it was, well, if I look at what they're charging and I look at what you're getting, there's an value erosion of anywhere between 25 and 50%, meaning, right, you're either not getting everything that you paid for, or you're paying a lot more for what you thought mm -hmm. you were going to be getting. Right. So those two things go together. 
And that's where I started to say, well, there's got to be things that we can do as an organization to coach our clients to say some of that money that's actually going into the systems integrators pockets ought to be in your pocket and not going to the systems integrators. And that became then kind of the foundation for this term of value erosion. It's kind of the delta between what you were promised and what you actually paid for that. Mm, interesting. Okay, great. Well, as we go through some of these folks, uh, keep us posted on your questions. I know there's a few of you lurking in the, the chat, but remember, you don't get to lurk on this show. So chime in. Um, so, so John, take me through this a little bit. Uh, Let's let's give me give me a couple that you would like to start with here in terms of tactics to reduce these value erosions. Yeah, so so let me start with you know I, I normally break up this discussion into three pieces, right? There's the there's the time from when you're going out to bid to the time that you actually get a contract. Then there's the time from when you sign the contract to all you're almost ready to start testing, and then there's the time from testing. Let's call it through hypercare, okay? One of the first things that I think all clients miss out on is the opportunity to, to leverage the free stuff, right? And what I mean the free stuff is if you're going out to bid for a transformation and you're going to go out to Accenture, Deloitte, and IBM, and you're going to go through an RFP process, it is absolutely the greatest opportunity for a client to extract value from the SIs at no charge, right? When you're going out asking them for, tell me what you think about our transformation. Tell us what you what your approach is for data acquisition. Tell us what your approach is for testing. That is a great opportunity to learn as an organization, right? While you're going through this RFP process, because you're getting all that as free advice. And one of the mistakes that I see a lot of our clients make is I'm gonna call it this concept of fairness meaning we're going to put our RFP together. We're going to ask all of these systems integrators exactly the same questions. And then we're going to compare their answers to those, th those questions. I sit there and say, hey, time out. Wait a second here. Why are you asking all the systems integrators exactly the same questions, right? Why don't you ask systems integrator, right, about data? Ask the second systems integrator about testing. Ask the third systems integrator about value extraction, right? And evaluate them on their ability to present a concept. But now in those three presentations, you're learning about three different, completely different sets of things. And as an organization, you've grown, right? It's, yep. And so to me, it's just a huge miss right out of the gate of not being able to extract value from the systems integrators because of this, I'll call it notion of fairness. Yep. All right. Well, Thomas is uh, already sh sharpening some knives in the chat, uh, as he usually does. Uh, he's getting ahead a little bit here, I think, in our discussion. But how should the SI's invoice instead? He's a huge fan of value-based pricing. Uh, how should the systems integrators invoice value-based pricing? Value defined how? Value defined by the what they're delivering, or value based upon what the customer has received, and have they moved forward? You know, in their value proposition. Well, you can clarify that, Thomas, in the chat if you'd like. What What do you say, uh, John, to your clients in terms of things like how should they assess pricing versus value? What kinds of advice do you give customers? Uh, I start off with, you know, uh, something that we were talking about just before, right? Which was, I'm looking at assets and I'm looking at talent, okay? Those two things dominate for me whenever I'm, I'm going to select a systems integrator. Um, are they bringing, I'll call it assets, meaning systems that are reasonably pre-configured to align with my vision of what the future is? Because that's going to be the fastest accelerator of, of anything that's out there in the market is if you find something that's closely aligned with where you want to be, that's going to get you there fastest, right? That's kind of number one. Number two is, are they bringing the resources to bear that are, all right, the yin and the yang, right? What I need. And have they been there, done that before? So are they going to coach me through this entire process? Those are the thing. Number one, number two. If I get those two things right, I'd be willing to pay a 10 to 25% premium to that systems integrator to deliver it because that's where the value is going to come from. Yeah, absolutely. 
Thomas raises an interesting point here around value is generated after the go live. I think one interesting thing about that is that, you know, historically in our industry, we had sort of like these huge projects and then you kind of shook hands and walked away. And, and in my opinion, these days, customers should really look for long-term partners. Now they might have, they might reduce their, the, their consulting burden when they, when they, when they're not in the middle of a big yeah. project, but, but in my mind, they, they should be looking for longer term advisors who can help them navigate these, tr these changes. What do you think? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm going to disagree with Thomas that value is, del is delivered after the go live. Okay. All right. All right. I'm, I'm going to disagree with Thomas from that because the go live itself is one is, is a step, I'll call it in the enablement. But if you're thinking about this transformation process, right, you're thinking about going down this journey, you're generating value, systems integrators generating value all through the process, because number one, they're going to be teaching you how you ought to be thinking about managing your business in the future. A systems integrator worth his weight in salt or in gold is going to be talking to you about your data cleaning Right. Everybody talks about data cleaning. I will tell you right now, if you're doing your data cleansing the right way, it's going to generate value prior to even going live. Right. If you're thinking about what those I'll call it, those things are, how am I going to do quick wins? Why wouldn't I be trying to change my business in front of the enablement of the software? Mm -hmm. OK prior to that, putting that in, in order to be able to start to get some of the value out of those new business processes, right? You know, there's steps you can take along the way to not make it so dramatic. And what mm. I would be, you know, again, coaching my clients on, on is don't think about that go live is that's when we're going to generate value. Be thinking about how your business is going to extract value all along the journey. Mm -hmm. So not to disagree with Thomas, but I'm going to disagree. No, this is good. Uh, this is what the show's all about. Uh, and and just just real quick on on this assets and talent thing, I, I have a different bias, which is which is towards industry because I I'm kind of sick of these horizontal projects of like, oh well, we just did an ERP product in in retail. Now we're doing one in in high tech, and we did a great public sector one last year. You could look at, uh, and the same for things like CRM and HR. What I really want to hear from from a systems integrator and this is one reason why i'm often biased towards smaller specialized integrators is i want to hear them come in and say well actually do you know in your industry two of your competitors behind the scenes are working on this that and the other and you're already falling behind and this other competitor that you want to imitate is already discarding that technology because they prove like that's what i'm looking for is is industry know-how more than anything i agree with the notion of the industry know-how and having to bring that in right now when i'm referring to assets right? I'm kind of a shirt referring to assets that are aligned specifically to your industry, right? There you go. That, that, that have done that before. And the same thing with the talent, right? Don't bring me in a retail guy to do a manufacturing project, right? I'm right. looking for somebody that's like that. I would hesitate, and this is just me, right? I would hesitate if the systems integrator came in and said, well, did you know what this guy's doing? Did you know what this guy's doing? Because I immediately would say, thank you very much for that information. Now get out of here because I don't want somebody in my house that's going to be telling my competition what I'm doing, right? So I'm going to take that information and then I'm going to throw you out. Yep, absolutely. Thomas, lots of good questions. We'll get to more of them, I promise. Uh, John, let's hear another tactic from your list. So another thing, uh, let's start, let's keep going in the, in the front of, uh, I'll call it my, uh, my list. I'm going to refer to something that the systems integration in systems integration integrators take advantage of what I'm going to refer to as the optimism death star. Okay. And the, op the optimism death star is, is taking advantage of allowing the client to believe that there's a happy path of the implementation of a transformation and it's the lowest cost, right? And, and I just sit there and I seethe every time I see a proposal where they've got assumptions included in there that are absolutely, you know, unachievable, like assumptions like uh, your firm will make all major decisions within two days. Never going to happen, right? But by putting that assumption in, right? They can then compress an estimate down to a really low mm -hmm. number. And then they take advantage of the hubris of an organization that says, well, of course we can make decisions within two days, right? It's never going to happen. 
right? Looks so, good on paper, but very hard to do. Well, yeah. well, yeah, and and I call it this optimism Death Star because, you know, we've all been coached ever since we were little kids to believe, right? Whether as our parents or our coaches, that you can do anything that you put your mind to, and the systems integrators prey on that that I'll call it that that concept of, well, you know, good companies can do this. So we've seen other companies do this before. You naturally should be able to do it when they know flat out well that they can't, right? And when you don't achieve those optimistic assumptions, boom, then the change order comes up because, oh, by the way, you're Mr. Client, you signed up for it. Everybody yep. wants to believe the best case. Everybody wants to believe the best case. Doesn't yep. happen. And then you have change order explosion and right. and and now you're regretting your entire decision to go with a low cost provider because their low cost was a farce. Exactly. And, and low co and low cost doesn't mean low price, right? I yeah. mean, they, they could be coming in and trust me, trust me, every single systems integrator, Accenture, IBM, Deloitte, put, pick your number out there. Every single one of them is going to leave something out of their proposal, something out that you need mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and they're going to do this kind of strategically to lower the cost that they're actually putting in forward putting mm -hmm. forward to you right and and you know part of what we do is as our company is we vet these proposals and we right. look at them not just for cost but we look at them for what is it that they left out right and yeah. you have to do a really good job of understanding what was left out because part of the way to reduce value erosion is to get the price right from the very beginning. Mm, right. Okay. I really liked your mention of the of that example of an unachievable parameter of making a decision in two days. Without putting you on the spot too much, are, do you have another example? Those are really interesting. What what else do you see that is comes up that is kind of unachievable? Uh, uh, well, an assumption an assumption that would be consistently put out there. Um, is that the client will will ensure that all legacy systems, right, or that the testing environment on the legacy systems will be ready to go. Every client, every client will say, "Oh yeah, sure, we've got legacy system testing environments." You're right, you do, but you don't have a testing environment that's aligned with the new ERP system that mm. you're actually going to be testing. Right. And so you're going to have to stand up a completely brand new legacy testing environment, or at least a, a strategy to stand that up that has data in it that's consistent with the data that you're going to be loading into the ERP system. I consistently see clients misunderstand what's going to be required there. Right. And when it comes time to testing, oh, by the way, we weren't ready to start the testing. And as a result, we have to take a delay. And the systems integrator then used as that time to delay to actually catch up for where they were behind. Yep. And and I think what this discussion is already showing is it's reinforcing one of my big agendas, which I write about occasionally on Diginomica, which is the importance of various flavors of independent advisory. Your firm is one flavor of that, because I just don't think that most customers are sophisticated enough like you described, to look at a contract like that and say, wait, these three specific issues are missing or this thing about the testing right. environment isn't accurate. That's just too much to ask of a customer, even right. an experienced customer. So right. um, we have a good question here from LinkedIn user. I know who you are and you're always welcome, even though you end up being anonymous. It's not a problem. Um, it's a LinkedIn glitch more than anything. It's not um, my boss, right? No, it is not. How has cloud changed ERP project implementations versus before there were clouds? I have a couple opinions on that, but I'll let you go first. Yeah. So, well, actually, it's it's interesting because we have turned uh, a little bit of research on it. Number one, right, We you see far less, I'll call it technology um, parts of an ERP implementation, right? So you're not seeing the, the systems integrators bring in as many, let's call it basis resources or, or things like that. Um, that's kind of the, I'll call it the big change in pricing. Um, but what I would say more than anything is there's much more of a tendency to adopt standard in cloud uh, implementations and kind of the forcing of the adoption of standards and maybe more of an, more of an acceptance by the, I'll call it the clients to begin with that because they're operating in the cloud, right? There's not gonna be as much customization is what they're used to 
in their on-prem stuff, right? Um, it, it's like it's like when you're going from ECC six to S four, right? If I'm already an ECC client, I already have a preconceived idea, right, of what SAP can do, even though mm -hmm. I customized the, the crap out of it. Right. When I go to S4, I already have a conception that says, right, I am going to be able to get exactly what I have on prem. If I tell somebody that they're going to go to the cloud, right, and they're going to use standard software and it's something they haven't experienced yet, then there's a perception that I'm not going to be able to customize it as much as I want. And so, therefore, you get more standardization, I think just because it's in the cloud, even though it might be available to you, there's more of a, I'll call it a predominance to adapt that standardization. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add that I think e even though I've hammered cloud ERP vendors a lot for for not necessarily being as free from lock-in as they might portray, I, I do observe some positive trends around cloud ERP that, that piggyback on your standardization point, which have to do with things like there's been, there has been overall a reduced consultant to implementation ratio versus on-premise, which is a beneficial trend for customers. There's also a change in project delivery that's occurred that the pandemic has accelerated, which is less need for on-site consultants oh. all the time and, and the management of more multiple projects on a remote basis, which is also, I think, mostly a positive trend as well. Well, and the other thing on that, you're exactly right. We've seen the same thing. But one of the things that we're, that we're seeing, at least in configuration of consulting agreements, is the on-prem consulting team largely meant full-time people on your site, right. right? Now you're seeing more part-time resources, right. right? And, right, now that companies have figured out that they don't need to have them on site, we're actually seeing increased offshore leverage. If you go back and look at where people were five years ago, the average project on offshore big project was somewhere between, let's call it 55 and 65% offshore leverage, right? If you look at that same number now, it's between 65 and 75. So there's kind of this adoption of, I don't need to have them on my site. If I don't need to have them on my site, then why do they have to be in my country? Exactly. Okay, I'm going to get combative with a couple of our audience members. Hope you enjoy this. John, not a problem staying pseudonymous. Anonymous is a misnomer in my humble opinion. Look, I'm doing a live show, so I'm going to have some misnomers, okay? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to concentrate on the topic here. So yeah, there's going to be some misnomers, but you understand what I mean. We have an understanding, so let's just move on from that. Thomas says, Ari, happy path. I have seen plenty of customers who did not want to hear that it's going to be expensive. They go for the lowest bid. Thomas, I'm going to push back on that and say that it's part of your job, if I'm being presumptuous here, and also upper edges and other people to educate customers that the lowest bid is not always the lowest bid, which is what we're talking about, which is the fact that the lowest bid is often dependent upon a number of deceptive factors and the anticipation of of, of uh, larding that up with change requests and scope creep. So part of our job is to make sure that is the lowest bid the lowest bid? And what I like about this discussion is that it's more focused on what kind of value are you going to get for what you're paying? Because to me, that's the core. So anyway, John, you can comment on that too. I just had to go off on that. That's okay. One of the things that we do as part, a part of our practice, John, is when we're doing comparisons of systems integrators proposal, one of the things that we provide our clients is what I'm going to refer to as a risk adjusted proposal value. So we're going to look at four or five different proposals and we're not going to compare proposal A to proposal B and say, oh, this one's $20 million. This one's $25 million. Therefore, there's a $5 million difference. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at that $20 million proposal and I'm going to say, based upon what I'm seeing here, you should expect to pay X at the end game with this vendor. And I'm going to look at the $25 million proposal and I'm going to say, you should expect to pay Y. And when I'm comparing those two proposals, I'm showing you X to Y, not A to B, because I really want you to understand the risk associated with each one of those vendors. Thomas says, when I am the SI, I can only educate that far. Well, Thomas, that's why you got to call the up reg <laughs> peeps and say, get in there and educate the client or you know whoever else you're going to call. Uh, and I would say go further, man. Uh, but I understand what you're talking about when you're bidding. It's a little tricky. Um, oh, it, it, absol it absolutely is. And I'll tell you what, some of our SIs, that some SIs love to see us, right? Because they know that we are going to be fair with 
the client in terms of what's really legit. And as soon as we, you know, as soon as they find out we are involved, they're not afraid to put the the right number in front of the client because they know we're going to vet out the, the guys that are not doing that. And Thomas, you say, okay, maybe I mixed the roles, have not worn the hat of the trusted advisor, but one of the bidding SI's hats. Fair enough. And, and look, I don't want to get too hung up on terminology here, but I would argue that if you do this right, that everyone's a trusted advisor. It's just that that what you're referring to, Thomas, is the independent advisor type of role in terms of selecting the SI, which is different. But I would argue that anyone worth their salt should be so-called trusted advisor uh, going forward, not just selling their own services, but that's another conversation. Uh, you would love to see a good advisor at the client side as well. Well, now you know what to do about that, Thomas. So uh, I think we've covered that well enough. John, give us another one of your uh, your value yeah. erosion points. Here. Yeah. So let's start. I'm going to move into the next phase, launch to test, right? One of the things that I've almost seen SIs become experts on is cultivating, right? accountability for the inevitable change order that's going to come down the line, right? They're going to be very good at using uh, something that's called referred to as the RAID log, risk, issues, actions, decisions that need to be made. They're very good at doing that. They're very good at running quality reviews, independent quality reviews that come in. We're going to bring our team in here, tell us if we're doing the project right or not, and identifying all the things that the client is failing to do early on. And then when the change order comes, because we've taken a delay, they're pointing back, right, to all of the things that they told you earlier, right, that the client wasn't necessarily doing the right things and saying, hey, we told you this earlier that, you know, you were failing in this reason. Therefore, we're now taking a delay. And look, we can point back here and we can show you that it was your fault right? They're experts at that. They know what's coming. They know how to negotiate a change order. What I tell my clients on is, all right, this is a little bit of tit for tat here, right? You also have to keep track of what the systems integrator is doing while you're traveling down this path. If they're not bringing the talent to the table that you expected, then you should rever reference that late raid log, use that raid log, get it logged in there, right? If you're not seeing the value, the deliverables, right, the, the expected content that you expected to see from the systems integrator when they expected to see it, you should log it. You know, get in there, lay exactly the same groundwork as what they're laying that in the event that there is some reason to delay the project, you've built that foundation, I'll call it, to support the change order. Now, the systems integrators can't balk at it because you're doing exactly the same thing that they're doing, right? You're just logging the issues of the project from that standpoint. It actually, I like to lay that groundwork to support a change order, but normally what it does is it also puts the systems integrator on notice that you're watching them, right? And if you're watching them, then they're going to perform at the level that they actually need to perform at because they don't want to see a quality issue logged on them. So, you know, it's it's nothing against the systems integrator. They're just doing their job. You just have to do it equally well. And I can tell you that could shift the price. I'll call it if I'm doing a $20 million project and I'm getting a $5 million change order from a delay, I will normally tell you that $5 million change order gets broken down like this. A third of it is easily defined as the client's responsibility. A third of it is easily defined as the systems integrator th responsibility. And there's a third in between that we're going to negotiate. And if that systems integrator is doing all the right th things to make sure that that other third ends up on your side of the ledger, then you're going to pay that. I'm going to call that value erosion, right? So you've got to make sure that you're lining up all of the things on your side of the ledger to maintain leverage, to push some of that change order back to them. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thomas, you're wrong here, John. We advised the philosophy biz because of what I stated above. Thomas, now you're getting into the nitty gritty of your business model. I, I don't think I can do that on this show. Um, what I what I would tell you is I, I think you guys are very capable and I hope you get lots of good business. Uh, I don't think that losing bids means you're doing business wrong. Uh, I've lost so much work in this industry by sticking to what I believe in and the values that I believe in. I'm not telling you that you should believe my values, but I, yeah. I would like I would like us all to do that. And then hopefully... 
we yeah. rise enough, we win enough deals that we succeed. I mean, that's yeah. how I look at this business. So. And, and again, I would look at it. Losing isn't bad, right? I mean, if you're if you're going to run four systems integrators in an RFP process, three of them are going to lose. Yeah. And, 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 and some customers are going to stick to their guns and go for the cheapest, crappiest yeah. contract they can find. And, and there's nothing you can do about that. And, no. and generally, you should be happy that you didn't get that business. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah I'd say that's probably a true statement. Uh, absolutely, Thomas. I mean, you, you're, you're uh, one of the reasons why the show is as good as it is. So I have no problem with that. Um, all right, John, give us another one. Um, I would say another thing that a lot of clients do is fail to access the entire organization, right? When you sign a contract with the systems integrator, right? Sometimes you fall prey to, I am only buying the people that are assigned to me, right? And not, I just signed up with Accenture. I've got a problem. These guys here that are on the ground can't solve that problem. I want to escalate it into the rest of the organization to have them go find the answer to this problem right? And lots of companies fail to recognize that they bought the organization, not just the few people that are sitting in front of them. So, you know, whenever whenever I'm working with the client and I say, oh, I see you've got five or six problems here, which ones have you escalated to Accenture beyond your team, right? If the answer to that is zero, then I know that they're not taking full advantage of, I'll call it the power of the entire organization. So it's another one of those failure points, John, where I say, you know, you're not buying just the people, you're buying the organization and you've got to make sure that you're leveraging that component of the organization. How do you do that? Make sure that your guys are escalating to the rest of the organization, the problems that they're not solving immediately. Mm. What are what are your views on this this notion of kind of, shortlisting. I, I find that so often in our industry, we still have the residue of golf course, what I call golf course relationships, which is like basically, well, this SI has been our main SI for all these years. So we might as well use them again, or, or they're already an approved vendor. So, you know, the paperwork's such a hassle. So we'll just stick with that. Um, and I feel like sometimes there's a lack of creativity, but at the same time, it's hard to evaluate 50 new firms too. Exactly. So what is your, what is your view on how to sort of narrow the scope and get it right? Uh, it's a great question, John. Um, I, first of all, I would most always have my, that whatever systems integrator that I'm using today, I would probably always have them in the bid process, no matter what, right? They're the ones that, they're the ones that understand your organization the best, right? Or theoretically do. Um, so even if you're planning on not using them, the information that they're going to provide as a part of their RFP response is going to be valuable in thinking about what the other vendors are going to propose. Okay. I will tell you more often than not, the systems integrator that you've been with it that the longest um, is probably not going to be as, as big of an advantage as what other people are going to perceive that they are because people remember more about the bad things about the incumbent than they do the good mm -hmm. things about the incumbent, right? And so the incumbent always has to deal with the baggage, right? That they've, they've been left with current projects. Uh, and I've seen a lot of incumbents lose because of that baggage, but I would always have them on no matter what, okay? Um, in terms of the rest of the short list, I think I would go, I, I think I would go this way, John. Um, I'm always a big fan of the RFI, okay, rather than the RFP to get started just for the learnings of this, right? And I would probably would start my I would start my RFI process to say, I'm I want to learn more about your organization, right? I want to learn more about your your company, but most importantly, I want to know who's the team that you're going to put on my RFP response. Right. And I'm just going to evaluate that team to begin with to say, do they understand the industry? Do they understand that? You don't have to show me anything else about your proposal. Just show me that those five people that you're going to put on this that you're saying is my RFP response and going to be the team that I'm going to be working with going forward. I would start with that as kind of my cornerstone of do these guys look like they've got the chops to do this? And that's the way I would do my elimination. And then I would say, don't go in with more than four. That's my feelings. 
makes sense. Thomas says, agree, if I do not win, win a project because I'm honest and serious, then I probably do not want it. So, Thomas, what you're basically saying there is that I was temporarily wrong, but fundamentally right. Um, I will accept that. Um, I want to go back to your previous question, Thomas, as long as John doesn't get assaulted by a, a dog. Um, hope everything is okay with home security there. Uh, Thomas asked earlier, why only the SIs and not only the software vendors? And I'll answer this first simply by Thomas saying that Upper Edge does look a lot of both. Um, in fact, when Adam was on here, we talked mostly about software right. vendors. This is simply just kind of a matter of a focused conversation where it gets complicated to tackle everything in one uh, segment, even even a generous long segment like this one. So it's, it's kind of just narrowing down. I'm sure John would acknowledge that the... Uh, the software vendor is a key player in all of this too. So. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Probably even more so. We're seeing the software vendors, obviously SAP and Oracle, they compete in the same space, right? They're out there. They're out there aggressively trying to win some of these SI deals. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it applies just to the, I'll call it just as much to the SI or to the software vendors as the SI. I'm assuming that dog's barking behind me. <laughs> uh. Yeah. It might be. It might be. I've got two dogs here that I'm babysitting today, so I may have to take a break and check on them because I got nobody here to help. Yeah, me. I I would actually recommend that you do that and make sure they're not going to kill yeah. each other. If you if, if you, you could, could if, if I could excuse yeah. myself, I'm going to mute you out for a sec. Our uh, first ever dog break in the history of the program. So. Uh, yeah, no, it's not. It's not your dog, Thomas. No, it's definitely John's dog. The sound can only be coming from him or me, and I don't have any dogs handy. So, also the software vendors. Yeah, yeah, totally, Thomas. And uh, we we actually got into that really nicely with with Adam before. So I encourage folks to check out the Adam Mansfield uh, podcast or video. Uh, you can find the podcast on Busting the Am Omni Channel. John is uh, unmuted again. Everything safe there and happy. Uh, yeah, the somebody was at the door. The dogs were going ballistic. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad. It, I'm glad there. It's it's cheaper than a real security system, and probably better. <laughs> so, uh, taking shots at SAP and Oracle as second tier hyperscalers. That that's kind of outside our scope today. <laughs> but uh, but yes, uh, there. Well, certainly in terms of revenues, we can look at who the top hyperscalers are, and it's not too hard to figure that out. Uh, John, we're going to run out of time in about 10 minutes. Do you okay. have a couple more? We didn't cover all 12 yet. Do you have a couple more that are? No, let me, let me jump out? into the, let me jump into the last section, right? I'm going to say one of the things that the systems integrators have a tendency to do is to, and, and again, I'm going to say this, that I have respect for all the systems integrators. They're all, they've all got really, really good people, right? But they're all in the business of making money. And to that extent, there is a tendency to lead you into what I'm going to refer to as the budget danger zone, okay? And the budget danger zone comes down to this. When you get ready to go live and you're on the cusp of going live, the bulk of the responsibilities for readiness belong to the client and not to the systems integrator. You have a responsibility for the data. You have a responsibility for uh, accepting the training. You have a responsibility for preparing the business to kind of shut down and come up. You have a responsibility to do the user acceptance testing. The longer that I can, as a systems integrator, delay, right, any obvious attention to myself as the systems integrator of not performing, the closer I get to the go live, the more likely it is that the failure to hit a date will be pinned on the client, right? And not on the systems integrator. So that, that budget danger zone is where everything kind of comes together of all of the client's responsibilities. And one of the things that inevitably happens is that the systems integrator will get the client focused on what the systems integrator is contractually obligated to deliver, they'll point them over here, right? And not necessarily spend as much time pointing the client to their responsibilities. And when the client fails to deliver on their responsibilities, because they've been so focused on helping the systems integrator deliver theirs, then the delay becomes the client's responsibility. Systems integrator says, ah, too bad, 
right? Change order required. And oh, by the way, you're going to pay us the extra money associated with that delay because you need to keep our resources engaged to do this, right? So I, I call this that budget danger zone. It's kind of the last third of the project. In order to be able to get away from that, you've got to be able to think about your resources as a client as the constraint resource. It's not the systems integrator resource. It's your resource. And you've got to be thinking about all your obligations and how you're going to pull forward, right? All of your obligations the best that you can. And when you're putting together that plan with the systems integrator, you're going to line up your resources and say, this is my constraint. Now let's build a plan based upon my resources being the constraint. It may extend the engagement, right? You may know earlier that you're not going to be able to go live in nine months. It's going to be 12 months, mm -hmm. but you'd much rather know that up front than you would right? When you're two months before go live and then you have to ext ext extrapolate it. If a system integrator knows that they've created this impossible plan, they're going to wait as long as they possibly can for it to be identified that it's an impossible plan because the probability is it's going to be you that they're going to be able to pin it on as not living up to your obligations. So beware of the budget danger zone. Yeah. And the other thing that interests me about about this point you just raised, which gets into resource constraints. When you wrote about the 11 IT enabled transformation leadership agenda items, you got into this notion of go out and get the B team, which I thought was was catchy and, and compelling because we always talk about the A team. Put your A team on the project. Uh, but but of course, sometimes there can be a problem with that. And, and to your point, if you don't have the proper resources allocated internally, then you're going to get into trouble. And so this B team thing was an interesting observation. I thought. Yeah. My B, I, I, I mean, I make a joke about it, right? When you, when somebody says go out and get the A team, that typically means average and available. Right. And when I say the B team, that means the bold and the brilliant, right? So go out and get your bold and brilliant, mm -hmm. but I'm going to give you an exception here, right? Especially when you get through this last section, the test through hypercare. This is an opportunity where I'm going to tell you the more feet that you can put on the ground when you're going live, the better off you're going to be. And I think companies miss sometimes the opportunities to go to their systems integrator and say, hey, I'm going to need a lot of people, right? I do not need your best people right here. I just need your people that are going to be reasonably capable of helping my people through the next step right? Or, or, or identifying where those problems are at or accessing the channels to get help. I found that if you go to a systems integrator and say, hey, do you have a whole bunch of these new college graduates that you're really trying to get involved in a project that they can put their name on a resume, right? If, they, if you get them here, I will take, I will take 20 let's call it marginal talents that just barely know how to log on to SAP to plant them all over my, you know, all over my plants as a starting point to provide that first level of help. And sometimes, John, you can get that for free because they're willing to give them to you to put that on their resume to sell to the next client. I haven't heard that advice in a while. Roll out the welcome wagon of junior consultants. Yeah, yeah but... but but to your point, I guess if you time it correctly in the project cycle, right. it could actually work. I need them to stamp out those fires, right? Do you know? I don't how think I want them it? configuring my software, but nope, nope. But if you can get them for free, John, and position them and position them throughout the organization, right? And these guys are willing to work long hours, and you can get them for free sometimes, John. So you know, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of free. Yeah, and and you also um, in this same eleven steps post, you talked about hold everyone accountable. We've talked a lot about holding yeah. the SI accountable. Do you apply that internally as well? And if so, how does that work? Absolutely, it's it's one of those things, John. Wherever I told my vendor, whenever I talk to my clients, I say, "Look, right, I know you want to hold the systems integrator accountable. I get that, right." But recognizing that the systems integrator is always going to point back to you as the reason, right, that we did not make the progress that we needed to make, you first have to look at yourself and you have to be able to say, what is it that we signed up for? Are we bringing the people? Are we making the decisions? Are we doing the things that we said that we were going to, you know, that we were going to do contractually? If you can 
hold that list. You can look at that list and say, yes, I am doing everything that I signed up for, right? Hold myself accountable. You are in a hugely strong position on negotiating, I'll call it your change orders now. So I always say, before you talk to me about them, let's talk about you first, and then we can talk about them. Mm. So you have to hold everybody accountable. And I would even say, go to the senior levels of your own organization, right? Hold them accountable. They're the ones that are going to sign up for this deal. Hold them accountable by saying, you will make the decisions that are required. Go to your systems integrator, get that inventory decisions that they think is going to be need to be made. Put that in front of your executive team and get a sponsor lined up for every single one of those big decisions. As soon as they're sponsoring that decision, all of a sudden they feel a lot more accountable and not the steering committee right? Don't get, hold the steering mm. committee accountable. I'm talking about each individual on that steering committee, line them up as a sponsor for what are those big decisions. And all of a sudden, you're going to get a lot better performance out of that steering committee because they all got to that level based upon feeling accountable. It's hard to mm. feel accountable as a team. It's really easy to feel accountable as an individual. Absolutely. Uh Interesting point here. Free is good, but also quite deceptive. I, I probably I'm going to answer for John a little bit here. I I think free is probably not the important takeaway there. I think this notion of 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 utilizing highly affordable resources at certain points in the project is the key, because obviously any kind of involvement of outside consultants is going to impose resource investment on the client's part as well. So yeah, there's no yeah. such thing as free in that context. I don't think that's really your point. No, it's you know my my point is not getting free. Although I will tell you again, in certain cases you can get it for free, right? Mm -hmm. My my point is though using the right resource at the right time, right? And using the right type of resource. I've seen a lot of companies kind of fall down by saying, "Gosh, I really want this really smart guy." When we're going into hyper care, he solved a lot of our problems but he's single threaded. He can't solve all your problems, right? And by the time it gets to you, the problem is too big. Right. So what I'm referring to in hyper care is making sure that you've got enough people to stamp out all of those fires before they turn into raging forest fires. And I guess that was my point more than anything yep. else is those resources are available. Sometimes you can get them on the cheap. Indeed. Well, we're almost out of time, John. Was there anything else that you really wanted to cover? You had a lot. You brought a lot of material with you. Anything else that you want to put out there? You know, I, I, I guess I, I spend a lot of time and I don't want to say ba bashing the systems integrators, but okay, that's part of my job is to really kind of make sure that co companies get the value out of them. I don't want to drain every, I never coach my clients to get to drain the systems integrators of every drop that they can get. The only thing I coach them on is always work to maintain some form of leverage. Right. So that if you need to apply it in a certain situation, you can. You cannot develop, I'll call it leverage on the fly. Right. It needs to be cultivated throughout the entire program. So that's what I really kind of teach my clients to do more than anything else is to continue to build leverage. Yeah. And to your point, you can't just do that from a relationships. You can't establish leverage only from relationships because ultimately those relationships are going to be defined by the contracts that you sign. And so the the leverage has to be built into the contract itself and then and then into the relationships. Yeah. You know what I would say on that, John, is that I like contracts. I love contracts. We do contracts all the time, right? What I like to say is the contract is where both parties decided that this was a fair agreement right? Everything from here on in is horse trading against that point, right? Mm -hmm. So I know at certain points where the system integrator is not going to be able to live up to his part of the deal. Okay. If he's not going to be able to live up to his part of the deal, then I should get something in return, right? So it's mm -hmm. that starting point of even that we all agreed on was a good deal and it just can't be one-sided from there on in. in indeed. And, and along those lines, I think when I look back to, um, you know, interviewing successful projects at, at shows and stuff, sometimes I interview the customer and the partner together. And honestly, what I look for the most is the strength of the relationship that I see. 
I, I, I look for the back and forth. I look for the customer giving the partner a little bit of a hard time about, yeah, there was that time when you uh, were understaffed that week and we had a big deadline and they come kind of laugh about it. I like that honest rapport that you develop with a true partner because you don't want to use the cliche battle tested really, but, but, but you do go through a trial of sorts with, with, with your partner in a project. And I want to look for those relationships that are tested yeah. where, where each party has a strong voice with the other. And it doesn't feel like one is dictating the terms or knows more than the other. Ultimately it should be a collaboration. And that's what I look for. Yeah. Trust. I'll call it trust, but verify, right, John? Yep. That says, okay, yes, we want to have trust, but we want to verify trust. And if that client had a problem, just don't let it be don't don't let it be a memory that said, oh, by the way, you remembered that you had this problem. Make sure that it's documented somewhere because that documentation ultimately is going to provide you the leverage that you need when they may change out, right, who that partner was, right? Because you got to have that trail that you can always depend on to be able to go back to. Perfect. And, uh, and finally, uh, LinkedIn user Lotus Notes implementation comes to mind when talking about raging fires. Well, it's funny you should mention that. I, I usually close the show with a couple of the things that I put in the WIF side of my weekly hits and misses column on which the show is loosely based. Uh, and uh, IBM had an internal email outage, and I put in last week a really funny thread on tech meme. Uh, with a bunch of people talking about, did they try Lotus Notes uh, when their e email was down, which I thought was funny. A uh, small side note, when I started my career in this industry, I was a Lotus Notes, uh, I ran a Lotus Notes recruiting desk in 1995. So I have this weird history with that. So that's kind of a funny reference for you to make because you probably, I guess, would not know that LinkedIn user. Um, and then also in the same edition, um, Jonathan Becker, um, sent sent me that a tech company canon installed cameras with ai ai enabled smile recognition technology in its offices which only lets smiling workers in a rooms or book meetings i believe this is taking place somewhere in asia i responded that that would be the end of my career so i'm a little concerned about that trend as well finally morgan stanley this is going to go in next edition. They disclosed a data breach. They said the compromised files were encrypted, which is very reassuring. However, attackers were able to obtain the decryption key during the breach. What the hell? Like, why would you, <laughs> why would you even bother saying the files were encrypted? That's just so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're not Seriously. encrypted. Come on, Seriously. man. They, they yeah, got away. They got perfect. away with the. They got away with the safe, right? But it was a combination safe. But they yeah. got that too. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, they were encrypted. Who gives a shit? Oh my goodness. Oh wow, Morgan Stanley. That is some bad PR right there. Just admit you got hosed. You screwed your customers. Let's move on. Um, most people know how to grimace. Yes, true. Well, that's the problem. Is the the smile technology is going to exclude me. Uh, oh, by the way, LinkedIn user, speaking of Asia Pack, he made this reference about the top three cloud providers. I thought I would mention just in that region, you probably have to put Alibaba in there too. So that would be the fourth. Just wanted to mention that because it's been coming up a lot lately and it's probably a trend to keep an eye on if you're following the hyperscalers. So with that, John, thank you for joining for this excellent discussion. You did not disappoint. Oh, I appreciate that very much, John. Anytime. Absolutely. Best of luck. Look forward to seeing you in person at some point. Enjoy Boston. Take care.